So we are set to go. We're ready to go. Good. I first want to thank In Rimsky Theater, the landmark on Main Street, and Kelly Renz Bruno for this opportunity, as well as Ellen Brown and Barb Schwartz. Thank you so much. I want to make this program very special for you. So I'm going to tell you a story that's going to make a lot of sense out of this program. Many years ago, when I was first married, and I had no money in the world, on a Sunday, my piano tuner told me that Eddie Duchin's piano was being auctioned off the following Wednesday. Eddie Duchin was a world famous pianist back in the 20s and 30s. I don't think anybody has come by to match his capabilities. So he told me, he said, Monday morning, nine o'clock, I want you to go to this place, beg, ask them any way you can possibly play the piano. So I got there at nine o'clock Monday morning, I introduced myself and said, I hear you have Eddie Duchin's piano. I would just like to play it for five minutes. And they kind of looked at me like I had two heads and I guess they felt sorry for this skinny little kid. So they said five minutes and then you have to leave. While I started playing, they put chairs next to me and they sat all morning and I played the piano for the whole morning. They said, would you like to play it this afternoon? I said, sure. They said, how about having lunch with us? So I had lunch with them, played it. They sat next to me. They said, would you like to have dinner with us? I said, can I play the piano after dinner? And I played it from nine in the morning to 11 o'clock at night. And I thanked them. I said, this has been the greatest day in my life. I can't thank you enough. And they said, would you like to take part in the auction on Wednesday? Now, the opening bid at that time was something like $10,000. No way was I going to come. The, I said, I, I couldn't raise that kind of money for the opening bid. And they said, how much money do you have? I said, in the whole world, I have $400. And they walked out of the room. And I just felt bad that here are these people who let me play the piano from nine in the morning to 11 o'clock at night. And I just insulted them. So I thought maybe I should leave. They came back a minute later and then they said, if you show up tomorrow morning with a moving truck and $400, Eddie Duchin's piano is yours. And I said, you know, I can't accept that. And they said, tomorrow. So just on the outside chance, I borrowed enough money for a moving truck. I showed up at nine o'clock the next morning. I own Eddie Duchin's piano. That is the piano that I'm going to be playing on today. And what makes this special, this is an all Gershwin Porter program. 90% of the songs I'm going to play for you today were recorded by Eddie Duchin. So probably many of the things that you're hearing today, he played on this particular piano. Uh, Cole Porter was born Cole Albert Porter on June 8th, 1891 in Peru, Indiana. He was a grandson of a millionaire speculator. He started violin at six, started playing piano at eight, and he published his first song when he was 11. He went to Yale studying law, and while studying law, he wrote about 300 songs. He then switched to studying music at Harvard. He married socialite Linda Lee Thomas in 1919, and he spent the next 20 years of his life just partying and traveling around the world until she passed away. He never had to rely on music for a living. He had a wealthy inheritance. He had financial support from a very wealthy wife. On October of 1937, he was horseback riding at the Piping Rock Country Club here in Locust Valley. The horse fell on him and crushed him. While he was under the horse, he pulled out a notebook and he wrote the song at long last love. He spent years undergoing surgeries on his legs and nerves. He was never able to walk again after the horseback riding accident. He was carried to socialite events by his valet. Unfortunately, in 1958, one leg was amputated and this was absolutely devastating for him. Eventually, both legs were amputated due to the complications and he died at age 73 in 1964. He was one of the very few composers who wrote not only the music, but he wrote the words. Night and Day is Cole Porter's most famous contribution to the great American songbook. 
I've Got You Under My Skin, became well known by Frank Sinatra. And Eddie Duchin had recorded both of these. And now I'm gonna do these for you on Eddie Duchin's piano, my arrangements. <laughs> George Gershwin was born September 26th, 1893 in Brooklyn. He was born of humble origins to a Russian Jewish immigrant family. And as a boy, he frequented the Yiddish theater doing errands for them, as well as studying, um, I'm sorry, uh, doing extra parts. He studied classical piano, but he loved jazz at 15 years old he left high school to work in the music business in New York City's Tin Pan Alley. Tin Pan Alley was where all of the publishing companies were. 
and they hired pianists and they hired George Gershwin to push the songs for singers and publishers. He also accompanied singers and at the same time he was writing his own music. You can imagine uh, his first song was published at age 18. He wrote the music and Irving Caesar, who was his boyhood friend, wrote the lyrics. George Gershwin became more popular and then his brother Ira Gershwin took over and wrote the lyrics. His first big song was Swanee and it was written on a bus in 10 minutes. I, uh, Irving Caesar spent 15 minutes and wrote the lyrics for the song. The song went absolutely nowhere. People's per, com, uh, publishers said it was not commercial, had no selling appeal. So he attended a party for Al Jolson and he sat down at the piano and played Swanee and sang it. Al Jolson fell in love with it and the rest is history. He recorded it, put it into his show Sinbad, it sold, sold a million sheet music copies and two million records. Um, I never had the privilege of working with George Gershwin, but close. I was performing at a hotel in Manhattan. This goes back many years ago. And during the break, a major D came up and said, a gentleman would like to speak with you. He's been listening to you. And I went over and I chatted with him during the break. And he said, you have no idea who I am, do you? I said, I said no. And the, ma the maitre d' said, Stan, you just played several of his songs in your last set. This is Mr. Caesar. I figured this is not Sid Caesar. I said, you're not, you're not Irving Caesar. He said, yes. And this was George Gershwin's lyricist at the beginning, wrote the, the music for Swanee. I felt about this big. I, I don't even remember what I played for the rest of the time. The next day I got a phone call from Irving Caesar's office saying that he wanted to meet me the following Monday morning and went to his office. I stayed up all night. I never slept. I was thinking of all of the excuses of what I can say, why I didn't know who, who he was. And as soon as I got there, he hands me this pile of music. And he said, go home, start rehearsing. We go into rehearsals next week. I said, for what? He said, he's doing a tour on the United States on the music he wrote with George Gershwin and I was going to accompany him. And I said, I can't do this. I'm at the Park Sheraton Hotel. He said, you have, I gave you a leave of absence. I already took care of this. Go home. We started rehearsals the following week. I had this huge section of music, every lead in, every song that we were supposed to do. It was like a science. We had it down to, it was perfect. We opened up at the Richmond Coliseum in Richmond, Virginia in front of 20,000 people. I've never seen 20,000 people in my life. And here Irving Caesar is on stage and I'm at the piano and I'm ready with a pile of music. And Irving Caesar says to the full house, since we're here in the deep south, Stan has been practicing Dixie and he's going to play his version of Dixie for you. I have never played Dixie in my life. That's... <laughs> Here I am in front of 20,000 people trying to fake my way through Dixie. My wife was in the audience and later on she said, I didn't know you were doing that. I said, neither did I, I probably lost 10 pounds. He goes into his first song and it's not the first song that we've rehearsed. It's in the middle of the pile. So now I'm playing with my left hand, trying to follow him, trying to find the music with my right hand. He never did one thing in the order of we rehearsed. He even put in songs that we never rehearsed. And we did this as a tour throughout the United States. George Gershwin wrote The Man I Love. It was written for the show Lady Be Good with its title of Girl I Love. It was dropped from the show. George Gershwin went into a lot. He wrote a lot of songs that were just dropped, were never used. He added it to the show Strike Up the Band in 1927, Rosalie in 1928. It was deleted in both. Now, this is interesting. Lady Mountbatten is an English lord lady who was a friend of his, took a copy of it back to England and had her favorite dance orchestra play the particular song. In the United States, it still would not sell. Couldn't do anything with it. 
At that time, sheet music was going at two cents a copy. So George Gershwin dropped the price to one cent, one penny a copy. And six months later, it sold 100,000 copies. It became the epitome of torch songs when Helen Morgan sang it and she was draped over the piano. Um, Eddie Duchin recorded both of these. The Man I Love and Embraceable You, both George Gershwin pieces. <laughs> ship between Fiji and Indonesia was bored. So in the afternoon, he wrote the music to begin the beginning. In the evening, he wrote the lyrics. He also had a big love for Paris. So he wrote, I love Paris and interesting. This was in a, what they call a society two-step. And this was made very, very popular by Lester Lennon in New York with his society orchestras. So I'm going to be doing Begin the Begin, I Love Paris. When I get to Say Magnifique, it's going to be a totally different style of playing. It's going to be a two-step, which is society type of music. Um, one of the things that Begin the Begin is personally very important to me. I had proposed to my wife and the first time her, she brought her parents to see me performing, I was playing Begin the Begin at the time her parents walked into the hotel. And little did I know that this was her father's most favorite song in the entire world. And this was the first time they met me and I won. 
Begin the beginning, Isle of Paris and Saint Magnifique. <laughs>
the mid 1920s, George Gershwin stayed in Paris and he wanted to study music with Maurice Ravel. He was the composer of Bolero and many other things. Ravel refused, saying that it would ruin Gershwin's jazz style. George Gershwin was also an excellent painter and he was friends with the composer Arnold Schoenberg. He and Arnold Schoenberg used to play tennis once a week and he painted pictures of his friends, including Schoenberg, and he wanted to study composition with Schoenberg. And Schoenberg would said, I would only make you a bad Schoenberg and you're already, already such a good Gershwin. I'm gonna do a medley of three of his songs. Again, these were recorded by Eddie Beecham, but not for me. Nice work if you can get it. And our love is here to stay. Interesting, the song, Our Love Was Here to Stay, this was written for the Goldwyn Follies shortly before he died of a brain tumor in 1937 at age 38. He never finished the song. Composer Vernon Duke actually completed the melody after Gershwin's death with the help of Oscar Levant, who remembered the harmonies of the song when Gershwin played it at parties. The song is a romantic ballad proclaiming that our love is more durable than the radio and the telephone and the movies that we know. Ira Gershwin wrote the music for this. Here's a melody of, but not for me, nice work if you can get it, and our love is here to stay. But not for me has a very special meaning to me. Years ago, I used to perform at a private country club at what they call the Beach House. And it was all open to the, to the water, so the breezes were coming in and the piano was near the doorway. And one night a gentleman came up to me and he said, I need to have a cigarette, but my wife will not let me smoke. So I'm gonna work out a deal with you. Every time you see me coming up to the piano, you play, but not for me. This way I can lean over the piano, be looking at you, have my cigarette, and my wife wouldn't know about this. Every week he came in, at his cigarette. We did this for 10 years. Every single week, I played this for him. As Soon as he got up from the table, I would go into, but not for me. He would stay, have his cigarette, the smoke would go out. And for 10 years, his wife never knew. So this was our secret together. This is the first time I'm telling this. So if you're watching, this is for you. <laughs>
my friend with a cigarette is watching that's dedicated to you. Love for Sale was written by Cole Porter, of the New Yorkers, a 1930 song, and it was sung by a streetwalker. It was banned in England, and it became a jazz classic by Emma Fitzgerald and Shirley Bassey. This is a little bit of a different type of an arrangement. This is my personal arrangement of Love for Sale. And, and this is great because a number of years ago, I had totally forgotten I had recorded this and I had to pull out the arrangement from the recording because I thought it would be great. And again, it's another song that Eddie Duchin recorded. So this is my version of Love for Sale. Gershwin Cole Porter medley. So again, these were recorded by Eddie Duchin. Someone to watch over me. This was described by George Gershwin's biographer, Dina Rosenberg, as the second in a series of great Gershwin ballads about looking for an, ex an elusive companion. The standard someone to watch over me was about a particular someone, an actual love that may be lost. This was written for the 1926 musical, OK, and it was introduced by Noel Coward's friend and contemporary Gertrude Lawrence, who sang it to a doll. And now this is fascinating. George Gershwin, quote, this doll was a strange looking object I found in a Philadelphia toy store and gave it to Miss Lawrence with the suggestion that she use it in a number and it stayed in the number for the entire time. Going to combine that with Where or When by Cole Porter and A Foggy Day by George Gershwin. A Foggy Day was originally written as A Foggy Day in London Town, uh, commemorating the pea soup type of fog that's in London. And then later it was changed to Foggy Day. So this is a combination of G George Gershwin and Cole Porter, Someone to Watch Over Me, Where or When, and A Foggy Day.
George Gershwin songs can be played many different ways. And therefore, over the years, people have recorded them in many different ways. So I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to take uh, a song called My Heart Belongs to Daddy. And this was written as a ballad. I'm also going to play it as a jazz torch song. Each time once. Third time is going to be as a swing. The fourth time as a jazz waltz and the fifth time as a rumba. The first time is the way it was originally written for the show. And then I'm gonna do four different variations on it. And this is by Cole Porter. <laughs>
relatively. They can't take that away from me about Tola Gutter. Tola met George Gershwin at a party honoring the composer Igor Stravinsky at the home of Edward G. Robinson in March of 1937. Also in attendance was Douglas Fairbanks Jr., Marlena Friedrich, Frank Capron, Capra rather, and her husband, Charles Chaplin, better known as Charlie Chaplin. During dinner, she was seated next to George Gershwin and they wound up having a thing together. Um, she would meet at his homes in Beverly Hills and on Palm Springs and she took a two week, a I'm sorry, a two month vacation with him in the month of 1930, the year of May 1937, just before Gershwin's death on July 11th. That same year, at the age of 38, Gershwin died from a brain tumor. Very much the composer asked for Paulette Goddard's hand in marriage and she refused, she refused to leave Charlie Chaplin. I'm going to do, they can't take that away from me and we're gonna do a slight diversion on this. There is a composer, a, a pianist, a really great pianist by the name of Errol Garner who became known a very particular style. One hand was slightly out of sync with the other. Um, one of his big songs was September in the Rain and it sounded like this. So you'll notice one hand is not quite in sync. <laughs> six nights a week next to a place on Long Island here, next to the Westbury Music Fair. And one night I decided to do a tribute to Errol Garner playing in that particular style. And it caught on, it became very popular. And every night I was asked to do a set in the style of Errol Garner. Now Errol Garner, when he played, he used to grunt. So he would play, and he would, be grunting, be singing the melody in his head, but grunting out loud. So I would add the grunts into the program that I was doing. And one night I was asked to do this and all of a sudden the place became dead quiet. And this was the huge piano bar and then seats all around it. And I looked up and there sitting at the piano bar is Errol Garner. He was in concert that night at Westbury Music Fair came into the piano bar for a drink, sat down and I was doing his imitation and his grunting. And I looked up and there's Errol Garner sitting there in front of me. Again, I felt like this big. Uh, you ever been in a situation where you want the earth to swallow? You just get me out of here. And it was probably only five seconds long. It felt like an eternity. And he just looked at me and he grunted. He went, mm. And I went, and I went right back. And that was the end of it. And that was super. And, and then we became friends after that. So this is, they can't take that away from me, George Gershwin, and also the way Errol Garner would play it.
Father God it because they couldn't take the numbers together. This is a Cole Porter song from Can Can, 1953 musical, written as a torch song, and it was not favorably received. It became a jazz classic made popular by Frank Sinatra. So we're going to do something very different. We're going to take Beethoven's F minor piano sonata, which goes like this. <laughs> and combine that with It's All Right With Me. performed in 1935, and it was a complete failure. It is now regarded as one of the most important American operas of the 20th century. It never became popular until after George Gershwin's death. George Gershwin published over 500 songs. He would sometimes write five to six songs a day. George Gershwin was the richest of all 
composers ever. One of his songs, Somebody Loves Me, from George White's Scandals, earned him, at that time, $15,600 in three months. This was more than Rhapsody in Blue made in three years. He was working in Hollywood when he complained of headaches. They did a spinal tap, revealed a brain tumor, and two days later, he was dead at the age of 38. Mozart died at the age of 35, was completely penniless and broke. George Gershwin left behind an estate worth millions of dollars and he never even made a will. Summertime, Porgy and Bess never became popular until after his death. And this is what I call the summertime suite. It's my combination of my arrangement of summertime and I got plenty of nothing. I hope you enjoy it.
was a thrill doing this. Um, it was a bit of a challenge to find all of the Gershwin and Cole Porter songs that were done, that were recorded by Eddie Duchin and to play them on Eddie Duchin's piano for you. So I had a lot of fun putting this together and I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I don't know if I turn this over to Kelly. Yes, hi, thank you so much, Dan. Um, if anyone has seen, you can take a look at the chat window and I listed um, a link that will take you to all of our afternoon tea events that you can register for to the free ticket link. Again, thank you so much, Dan. It was really wonderful having you. This is by far one of our more popular programs. We had about 95 people on one time um, and people are just typing in messages saying, thank you, wonderful. Um, again, if you have any questions for Stan, you can message them right now. Um, otherwise people are just are you, are you yeah, I'm open. And uh, I mean, I do miss hearing everyone applaud you. That really was beautiful. Um, Thank you. And I appreciate everyone's patience with this new virtual world on Zoom and with social distancing. So I hope everyone appreciated being on. Um, so far, people are messaging. Great way to spend the afternoon. Stan, that was marvelous. Thank you from Charles Runco. I would be very curious if you get a comment from the gentleman who smoked